politics and religion feel as if they've become pressing questions of our time, the relationship between the two, the role of the church and Christianity, particularly in the West, whether that be seen in Russia with the way the Orthodox Church sanctions Putin's actions, but differently in the Western part of Europe too, asking whether Christianity can underpin our ethical sense, whether liberalism has lost its way, what the role of the church is in this part of the world too, to be a kind of moral conscience. And I wondered what William Blake had to say about these questions, because he too lived in a time of failure, political failure, and to his mind, church failure. And he thought deeply about what the problem at root was, not just looking for quick solutions, but for something that might be truly different and radical. The political failure of his time and ours, he concluded, was not actually one of leadership, nor was it one about lacking practical solutions to the problems that people face at root, which is why you might say people tend to distrust leaders and to distrust technological solutions these days. It's not that they don't deliver nothing, but people sense that leadership and technology itself is not getting to the root of the problem. And Blake felt that what was at the heart of the failure was a lack of vision. He felt that we needed to ask again what politics is for. Is it for safety primarily? Is it for growth primarily? No, he thought, because both safety and growth are ultimately not just unsustainable, but unsatisfying. He was quite clear that we human beings in this mortal life will risk who we are if we feel we might find not just more and more, but the heart of life, the all, as he put it. And similarly, justice is not enough of a guide for all that that matters in one part of life. Partly because modern notions of justice, Blake realised, have become about protecting the individual rather than connecting the individual to a wider reality. Becoming aware of our source and wellspring rather than just cocooning ourselves from others around us. This is one of the reasons why he felt justice fails as a complete guide. So the political failure, you might say, at base, is spiritual. And I think that, strangely, this is what the churches struggle to recognise now too. I suspect because, in a way, they're caught up in the same spirit of failure. They seek growth, much like the rest of the world seeks to grow, as a kind of substitute for knowing the truth and trusting in that, regardless of where it takes you. Similarly, Many Christians turn to reason or to empirical evidence to prop up their beliefs, writing apologies, seeking textual proofs, miraculous proofs, rather than turning to the knowledge of and participation in the divine itself, which is known within, trusted within, and develops the awareness that nothing really can shake one from that. Blake noted that the bounded is loathed by its possessor. If you live in a bounded world, one shaped by the human imagination, one whose limits are set by what reason or empirical evidence sets, then you come to loathe that, we humans who don't just want more but want all. And we abuse this bounded material world out of an inner rage, ultimately, that it doesn't satisfy our desire, doesn't deliver us. And so wild consumption is part of the failure of now as well. It's a despair which you might define as not being able to possess what is most desired. Hence, you see, too, the spectacle now of atheists who miss belief in God, as if that's a kind of 
nostalgia that they wish they could return to, or similarly believers becoming fundamentalists in one way or another. They're narrowing the vision that their religiosity really calls them to, so that it becomes something that they feel they can grasp, they can possess, they can prove, they can rely on because they understand it. But as Blake noted, he who sees the rational sees himself only. Religion for the atheist as much as for the believer become merely a mirror of a limited sense of things, which you see. And then add to that at an institutional level, not just at a personal level. People at the level of institutions that turn growth into the measure of their success. It's a pretty clear indicator that something's gone wrong. Um, you see it in the Russian Federation trying to grow the power, control, the reach of its governance across lands like Ukraine. And you see it, I think, in a very different way, for very different intentions, even in the EU, as if the EU's vision is somehow supported by the fact that more and more countries are joining it. There's reasons why that happens, of course, but as a measure of political vision, it is not a good one. Again, because growth sees only itself as it accrues more and more to itself and not what it is in the service of. Now, Blake devised a fourfold vision, as he often did, to help discern and guide both himself and others through this depressed state of affairs. He, at the political level, talked about London, Babylon, Golganusa and Jerusalem, four kind of city-states, if you like, four political arrangements and ways of life. London is how our life at a shared level shows up when we don't think about it. It's the mere appearance of things. But it can fall into Babylon, which is a desperate, inhuman, machine-like approach to life. It's the dark satanic mills made manifest. But human beings can also work for what he called Golganusa, his third way of understanding politics. And this is a flawed but nonetheless searching city. It sees that politics and life must be about more than just itself, its own preservation, its own exercise of power. And the great thing about Golganusa is that within Golganusa can then be detected the fourth, the full fourfold vision of human life, which is Jerusalem, the divine reality that shows up in Golganusa. He works this out in epics like the Four Zoas, Milton, Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion, and conveys the dynamic so that we can feel it at work within ourselves, both individually and at the social level. And often his guide here is the prophetic figure of loss, the embodiment of imaginative questing and searching, of desire, of restlessness, of never quite giving up on the hope that Jerusalem can be known. But loss fails. Loss has to learn how to deal with failure. Because when he seeks to build in Babylon, in the Eurozenic world, shaped only by reason and empiricism, his imagination can't get a full enough purchase on reality. Reason rules, not the heart. And so this explains why the dark satanic mills are dark. They're dark because they don't know the light of Jerusalem and eternity. They try to light themselves from within quite literally, of course, in the modern world. And they're satanic as well, which for Blake means a fixation on limit, a kind of blindness, an opacity to the depth of things. And as a substitute, therefore, becoming enamoured with the material world, with false glories, with false lights, um, as if accumulation is the same as abundance. Um, material consumption is the same as spiritual realisation. This way of life also seeks to build substitutes for vision in the form of ethics, 
one of Blake's most surprising but powerful critiques as well is against the moralising way of modern life. It's well-meaning in itself, of course, like the justice that seeks to protect the individual rather than connect with reality, but lacks its true goal. And so Blake says, wastes life. It also consumes life by breaking life down into particular issues and then fighting over issues, drawing red lines to exclude those who are deemed as enemies. And so tribes form when ethics rules, culture wars, and life dissolves into Babylon, even as it seeks to sustain life through ethical mores and principles. This is a way of life that's seeking to bend what we know of reality to its will. And in particular, when it comes to the fear of death, Blake realised. Another reason that consumption gets out of control, because it's asking this limited opaque material appreciation of reality to deliver eternity secretly in our hearts and of course it can't do that and so we exhaust it in that demand. Now the way beyond and through this state of affairs is not by trying to turn your back on it, Blake also realised, but is trying to live through it, see through it and ultimately this means turning towards the failure, turning towards death. What has to die is the desire to give structure to life through the reason and empirical approaches that have failed. And this is immensely failure because this way of life alone is trusted. It's felt to be the only good way to do things. And so leads to anxiety on the one hand, bloodshed at another level. Um, desperation becomes endemic. The spectre grows, Blake said. He who is the shadow of Orthona, Orthona being the spirit of imagination that's in touch with the divine vision. And so it leads to what you might call false imagination or vision, which really shows up as paranoia, imagining that others are untrustworthy, imagining that your vision is being taken from you by others. It sees enemies everywhere. It breeds conspiracies. Again, features of life today. But Loss, who is a prophet rather than a priest, one who seeks more rather than just seeking to preserve what is, knows ultimately the human spirit or imagination is connected to the divine spirit. And so ultimately, whilst a culture can feel that God has died, Loss knows that that's not so. It's just that the horizons beyond which we can see the divine have been lost touch with. Um, it knows that whilst the church may preach, there's an unbridgeable gap between humanity and the divine. That's not true. It's that humanity has lost awareness of the divine within it. The times have lost touch, have become uncoupled. And recognising that is the first step towards feeling there can be a re-engagement, a new awareness. Loss seeks to stay connected to that and does that by building the city of Golganuza. It's a city born in between times, preparing for visionary approaches to return, visionary capacities to be restored. It's one of Kairos, expectancy rather than just Kronos grinding away. It's one of apocalyptic in the true sense where that which is desperate is seen as the veil being torn down so that which is true might re-emerge. Politics, whilst usually being thought of as building a better society or seeking stability or secular goals described by the human mind lost in this world alone, must be let go of. And if you hold off too quickly from a renewed or replacement vision, Blake realised, that becomes possible. Something's gone wrong in Babylon. It can't be fixed from within Babylon. It's not just a practical problem. It's an epistemic problem, one to do with reconnecting with the true ground and wellspring of our being. So there is this first step of trying not to formulate a big vision that's really a false vision, holding off from rushing towards that. 
difficult for political leaders, difficult for individuals as well. And instead, loss turns, though, to what Blake calls minute particulars. And these are particular isolated instances of the divine vision and of the all that break through in spite of the darkness, in spite of the desperateness. It is wary of generalizations and abstractions, which are a bit the blind leading the blind. They see only themselves too. They're really efforts to gain power, take control, and so aren't open to the all. But the minute particulars in life are humble, and they're like dust catching the light, Blake says at one point. He describes them also as flashes of inspiration, and he himself felt that they came to him as if dictated from elsewhere. It's about having virtues that compare tension rather than seeking quick solutions or feeling practical, making must be the way to go. Instead, it's about devotion, about love, about attending to what you really long for and aligning with those desires as they reach to the all rather than seek quick satisfaction. It's also not so much about innovation or skills, many of these political values of today. It's much more about gathering together what's given, seeing life as in a gift, as something that's abundant, and so rebuilding the vision from these minute particulars. Blake says this of his own process, actually. He writes, the time it has taken in writing his poets, his poems, was thus rendered non-existent, he says in a letter to Thomas Butts. He knows that when he's in this zone of detecting the money particulars, he's also in the zone of eternity. And it's the kingdom that's not of this world, to use the Christian metaphor, and being alert to its presence in this world. So the imperative is to cultivate a way of life that's open, that's attentive, that's contemplative, that's receptive. And people do do this spontaneously, in fact, though not always wisely, Blake might say. Um, they'll try to build local community rather than seek national political solutions, or they'll try to adopt a spiritual practice rather than just getting through life by sheer willpower. Um, they might turn to craft or conservation because they know that's connecting with the world in a different way. I think it's why social prescribing is an increasingly sought solution in the mental health crisis. Um, there'll be resistance, say, to legal impositions, to heavy-handed government, um, realising that no one quite knows what they're doing in that though that can also, of course, lead to conspiracies, the unwise move. And there's also a desire to take risks, to go to extremes, um, to jump off the edge one way or another. And I think this is something about recognising that the end of an old way of life, death, is the way to go, but without quite understanding what that actually means. And so it is genuinely risky rather than guided by the all. But think more on this way of death. Blake puts it centre and you might say that failure and the presence of loss, of mortality, is a good indicator that something is changing, something's being faced. So ask though whether it's about trying to control that which feels fragile and vulnerable or whether it's an effort to dissociate from reality, to create a kind of utopia, living in isolation rather than saying yes to more and more of life. Is it promising utopia or a panacea or a form of self-salvation as if we can do it? That's another indicator that facing our mortality and limits is unwise, it's going wrong. And then also Blake was very wary in the more religious guise of faith in faith itself, fideism as it's now called, um, as if throwing your hope blindly on a God who otherwise feels absent 
is a way to go or nostalgically wishing that religiosity would return as many atheists seems to be doing now. Blake wants us to see, he wants us to perceive, not to go through the darkness without the hope of awakening. But this second step though is really crucial as you discover if you read his great epics, um, becoming conversant with failure, becoming aware of the presence of death. It's an inability to tolerate um, what may seem incoherent or fantastical or improbable that starts to become the virtue in a sort of second stage with this, that which the rational world, the empirical world would dismiss as if death really is the end. And this kind of reason will mock the divine presence, mockery of course being a substitute for power. Um, the scientific materialism that is so dominant in the world that says no, the limited way of life is the fullness of life, or conversely, the conspiracies that seek some kind of hidden cause or meaning in things that gives itself away because ultimately it's still beholden to the empirical or the rational. You know, evidence will be gathered to show that the conspiracy is true. A strange new logic will be cited to show the same. These are all indicators that something is not being understood as Blake would have us do it. You might even say that when a better tomorrow isn't directly promised, but rather tomorrow is said to be the continuation of the preparation of today, Blake trusts that more, in fact. I think psychotherapy offers a bit of a model here when it resists the pressure to come up with short-term solutions and instead says, no, let's attend to what's going on. Let's try and understand it, trusting that it's got something to show us, something that might be revealed. In a Blake mode, you might say songs of innocence must be accompanied by songs of experience. Songs of ex innocence are Blake's poems where the assumption is life is for us. And that's so, Blake says, but they must be accompanied by songs of experience, which know also that life can seem to let us down, really because it wants us to let us into more. Um, the lamb must be linked to the tiger. The little lamb who made thee, dost thou know who made thee, must be linked to that which seems fearsome, the tiger. So we can ask, did he who made the lamb make thee as well? And if that becomes possible, if today is held out as a preparation for a new tomorrow, not just an increase in what we hope for today, then Golganusa starts to form around us. Here's a few lines on how Blake actually describes Golganusa to get the sense from him. The great city of Golganusa, he says, fourfold, toward the north and toward the south, fourfold, toward the east and west, each within other toward the four points. So there's a sense of linking up here between the north, south, east and west, which in Blake's mythology stands for the felt linking to the rational, linking to the instinctive, linking to the imaginative. Eden and toward the world of generation and toward Beulah, Eden, generation, Beulah being other aspects of what we long for and what we're capable of. Ulro is the space of the terrible starry wheels of Albion suns. Blake says when it's uncoupled from these other things, seeing the cosmos as a vast emptiness rather than a deep expanse expressing the divine soon. But that toward Eden therefore becomes walled up, he says, till time of renovation. Yet it is perfect in its building, ornaments and perfection. For all the things can feel they get lost. Ultimately they can't loss, Blake, the prophet, knows when the dark night of the soul can be faced. And so in a way this leads to a third step where this darkness itself becomes a kind of guide 
it's dark in one way because as the great spiritual traditions tell us it's a letting go of that which has been trusted the rational the empirical but it's also a shining darkness or we can become so because when that is let go of new modes of attention become possible new experiences of reality start to shine through you might say it's about letting go of the mundane the vegetable as Blake put it as if life is just straightforwardly biological and that's all letting go of the mortal vision that fears immortality and so consumes its mortal life so that the divine vision can show up can be free to show itself because our attention has let go of that which we would cling to and instead can kiss the joy as it, as it flies and begin to live in eternity's sunrise. It's realising that eternal life can embrace what seems like eternal death. But that's only really known and trusted when the mortal, the failure, Babylon has been faced. Then Golganuza can start to show through. Jerusalem or the Eternal City, is in Golganuza. It emerges from the present darkness, Blake says, drawing on the image of Jesus, emerging from the tomb. And so he writes, And Los and Enitharmon builded Jerusalem, weeping over the sepulchre and over the crucified body. That's where Jerusalem comes from which to their phantom eyes appeared still in the sepulchre. The false illusion that the sepulchre is all. But Jesus, Blake continues, stood beside them in the spirit, separating their spirit from the body. This is the beginning of Jerusalem emerging. That separation of the spirit from the body not being a dualism, but being a mental awareness, a mental separation that's about a depth of vision so that the body is seen now not as vegetable, not as mortal, but as a reflection of immortality, as shining with the divine spirit. It's about being, know, being able to know what the natural is in its truest state, not guided or not unguided, in fact, by blind forces of struggle and survival, of the fittest, but rather radiating with the divine life as it reaches instinctually and longingly and imaginatively back for its wellspring and source. It's a portal of the spirit when the body's known properly, Blake realised. You might say it's a true unity. And this is not just about integrating or having a dual aspect take on reality a bit like the panpsychism of today that tries to answer these questions. Rather, it's about this connection with the origin. Blake says, if we unite in one, another better world will be opened within your heart and loins and wondrous brain threefold, as it was in eternity. And this is the fourth universe, will be renewed by the three and consummated in mental fires. The three of Golganuza's joining to the four of eternity and the priority there of mental fires, I think, is really significant. They show that all of us will be involved, the heart, the loins, the brain, but the imaginative vision, the cognitive, the mental aspect in its richest sense is the transformative perceptual element, making the threefold fourfold. And so that leads to a fourth step, you might say, building for divine vision in our ways of life individually and collectively rather than a politics of self-preservation promised to the society or to the individual. This is about kindness, Blake says at one level, because every kindness is a practice of death, a little death, he says. It's kindness not as a moral injunction, this is what you should do, but as a practice that decenters oneself to discover a new centre, perhaps first of all in another and then in reality itself. And notice too, it's a practice rather than a theory. It's attending to the minute particulars of every encounter rather than resting on an abstract generalisation. 
It's one that's embodied, therefore, but the body's seen as that which channels divine life, the bodies that are around us, that reveal the divine vision to us. And it fosters a way of living that is at the human scale, um, rather than grand metrics that, like false gods, can pretend to judge how things are going for good or ill. The ways favoured by the rational and empirical desperation to keep things growing. Golganuza can be a place where life is sustained because it's open to the source of life. Therefore, it's one founded not so much on art, as many secular commentators on Blake say, recognising the artist in Blake in the artist in themselves, but forgetting that Blake is ultimately a religious figure. But resting, Blake thought, therefore, on love of others, of self in the proper sense, but also of life itself, because it is known to be alive in the same way that we're alive. It suggests even a different economic policy. Jesus walks through the marketplaces, Blake says in Golden Uza, because linear growth is no longer the main aim of market activity, but that which fosters us to become more human and so more divine. Money is in the service of life rather than life being in the service of money. And it's not just about material redistribution either. The trouble with focusing policy on redistribution is that it secretly gives priority to the material as if that were a goal in itself. Redistribution is necessary in some way, but Blake's not so concerned whether that happens through mechanisms favoured by the left or the right. What is much more important is that redistribution enables people to foster then what really matters in life. And that, you might say, is really learning, education in the broadest possible sense, by which is meant that the first move of any true education is how we ourselves change how our own perception opens up. It's not the brain dump, the brain dump of information, growth kind of education, but is the visionary, virtuous, cleansing the doors of perception type of education. That is really the way we might govern any kind of shared approach to these things. And a different city starts to appear. Blake describes it like this in the city of Golganuza that can sustain and foster this emergence of Jerusalem. He says, the stones of Golganuza are pity and the bricks well wrought affection, enamelled with love and kindness and the tiles graven gold, labour of merciful hands, the beams and rafters of forgiveness, the mortar and cement of the work, tears of honesty the floor's humility, the ceiling's devotion, the hearth's thanksgiving. These are the qualities that you know are taking you through the fear of death towards eternal life, kindness and love, devotion, a proper attention to your desire and following those threads, forgiveness for the mistakes, the fears, what goes wrong, honesty, directed towards oneself as well as demanded of others. Humility, which is the openness that can let more and more of life in. And thanksgiving, that is the receipt of what's being let in and the preparation for receiving more. It's also about critique. Blake can be strong and tough in his rhetoric, um, but always in the service of the true perception. So critiquing reason for reason's own sake critiquing empiricism for its own sake, but so as to recover the intuition, the imagination, the inspiration that in Golganuza reason and empiricism start to serve. We do want it all, Blake can repeatedly insist, not just the promise of more of this and more of that, but the question then becomes how to know it all, how we can find that within us, how we can sink into being itself, how we can Be aware that it's not objective stuff that will give us our heart's desire, but that a turn to that which is known 
in the subject, in ourselves, because that is the portal to life itself, to the divine. We are mental creatures, Blake insists, not vegetable bodies, and so resist natural explanations for things, resist evolution as if it were blind, including in religion. Religion, for example, is not about the good of society, preserving society, preserving safety. It's about the transformation of us all. And Blake is quite clear that the church that falls into the service of politics, acting as the moral conscience of the political status quo, has failed quite as much as one that sanctions violence and warfare and bloodshed. It's all about ontology. It's about being. It's about awareness that eternity is not a different world, in fact, but is a correct perception of this world. The old Pauline injunction to be in the world but not of the world. Discovering a vision of infinite life rather than mortal life. And this infinity being seen in the minute particulars that are like momentary revelations that can be built into the city of Golganusa. He who sees the infinite in all things sees God, Blake says, which is appealing to that careful devotion and attention, that love of life at the human level as it comes to you. And so it suggests a proper relationship between religion and politics too, I think. Religion not about propping up politics or being a moral conscience, but rather having a correct distance from politics so it can lead Golganusa towards Jerusalem, realising that politics is not the end, but is a means to this wider vision. It's about rendering to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, because that is good to keep life going at one level, but rendering to God that which belongs to God, because that is what can satisfy us in ways that politics and material reality really can't. It's about trying to bring awareness of the kingdom that is not of this world, but the kingdom that also at the same time is within, as Jesus said. A telling note in Blake, for example, is that he describes cities as human beings. They're alive when they're seen correctly. They have a sense of soul of movement, of dynamism, of yearning, quite as much as human individuals do. And so you can test that yearning. What's it yearning and reaching for? The real source of life or artificial substitutes for life. But when it's known as reaching towards the divine, Blake says, my streets are the ideas of the imagination. My houses are thoughts that felt inner quality of things is lived in aligned with and so can be followed and Jerusalem can start to appear in a world that's experienced like that not on the surface not on London's mere appearance but on Golganusa's spirit and soul nowadays we might see I think this as much in nature as in cities because in a way cities have become too total since Blake's time they can envelop us completely remember Blake lived in a London that was never more than half an hour's walk from the countryside, whereas now you can travel by fast transport for over an hour and not reach the edge of the total city, what Blake might have called Babylon. The walls of Babylon are souls of men, he said, perhaps anticipating our times, her gates, the groans of nations, her towers are the miseries of once happy families. That describes cities more accurately now perhaps and so nature might be where we feel the minute particulars more but what's important is that the life we build collectively individually is this Golganusa life that is one of devotion and love of forgiveness of thanksgiving of imagination the city that is within the Jerusalem that will be given to us we can't build Jerusalem, Blake stresses, heaven can't be made on earth if earth is imagined as this mortal material frame, but its presence can be discovered in the struggle to live 
within mortal life, when abundance shines through what otherwise seems scarce because the particular is valued, not the accumulation. Jerusalem is known through activities of contemplation, of knowing, not blindness, of loving, following the desire. And it's marked, Blake says, by gates of thanksgiving, windows of praise, clouds of blessing, cherubims of tender mercy. Again, these qualities come up time and time in Blake's poems. Tender mercy or forgiveness for what's gone wrong, because that always makes space for more. Praise, life being enjoyed, not because it's owned, but because it's delighted in. Thanksgiving, because that's about the attitude that enables gift receipt as much as gift giving and life therefore experienced in that way. And blessing, because it's seen to have come from the source that is our source as well, the divine vision of God. So in summary, the failure of our times, the failure of politics, the failure of a correct relationship between religion and political life is also an opportunity. Blake is quite clear. He understood it then in his time and it applies to our now. It requires a first step in the first instance of stop trying to formulate too big a vision because it's been born in a confused, unaware state. Becoming instead conversant in a second step with the failure, with the presence of death, following that through is the way to go because it is about letting go so that a third step becomes possible where in the darkness a new light can be seen to shine and a new capacity for perception enables that otherwise hidden light to be followed that shows a path of life to the fourth step which is building not for self-preservation but rather for the divine vision. It's about seeing London in its Golganusa form, becoming aware of how it can fall into Babylon manifestations and always being attentive to the Jerusalem that presses in, that's in this world, but not of this world, though this world can increasingly intensely shine with it when we know we don't possess it though we long for it and it will be given